selected no. Okay, so thanks very much for joining us today for the York uh, Technology for the York Pedagogy session. And the aim of today will be to look at different case studies and how they align to principles within the York Pedagogy. So the first thing to look at then is what is this York Pedagogy? Um, at the moment, it's currently being rolled out to the undergraduate programs and the development phase for the postgraduate programs is going to be starting very soon. And there are five elements to the York Pedagogy. Um, they're all underpinned um, and, and led through program leadership, so someone taking ownership of the program and the direction for it, and they are responsible for ensuring that the program is um, developed in a way that meets some program learning outcomes. So these six to eight program learning out outcomes are distinctive about that program, so they, they're the way to identify what the graduates will as a result of undertaking a particular degree program. So graduate attributes are often another way of looking at program learning outcomes. So program learning outcomes um, are then, uh, they, they come out of the, the summative assessment throughout the modules. But what we'll be actually focusing on as part of this webinar are the two aspects of the York pedagogy that occur throughout the module process. So throughout the, the, the teaching process, and that's the idea of student work that is structured and requires students to do work in class, out of class, in their own time, how we can use that student work to support independent learning and independent study, and then the ideas about staff and student contact. So how can we make the most of that face-to-face -face contact time, and where are there opportunities to have contact with students beyond uh, the face-to-face -face environment? So that's the context we're working in within here, the institutional um, agenda of the York pedagogy. So learning technology fits within this because we'll be looking at how technologies can actually be used to support student learning. What we're never looking at is how technology can be used to make something a little bit more witty, a little bit more fanciful. Everything that we do within the learning development team is to encourage you to think about the learning enhancement. So how technology can be actually used to support students with their work, with staff student contact, leading them towards the module learning outcomes, and then within the module and the program towards the program learning outcomes. So we're trying to create here some engaging learning experiences that actually have a clear learning value. So this particular webinar is divided up into three sections. The first section looks at student activity and we're framing this with the online component, how student activity can be structured and designed before and after the face-to-face -face contact time. So the first question I have for you, and this might be a little bit of a tricky question or maybe one that shows how your expectations might differ from reality, but the question I have for you, and I'd like you to use the text chat box just to post a few ideas, doesn't have to be fully formed ideas, just your initial thoughts. What do you actually expect students to do with the course content before or after the face-to-face -face contact time? And you can interpret this as, well, how do I know they're actually learning stuff? What am I actually expecting students to do on the module? So post your thoughts onto the um, text chat box. I'll give you a few seconds for that. So feel free to post anything into the text chat box. If you're not sure, that's fine too. Just use a little emote icon to post a quizzical look uh, and we'll move on.
Thanks, Carmen, for saying that. So, uh, Carmen has said to use the materials given in class and shared in the VLE and bring homework and queries to class to receive feedback and have their queries addressed in a timely manner. So, there's some very key ideas here. Um, the first is that there is content that's given in class uh, or on the VLE, and that content is being used by students as part of some sort of activity, i.e. the homework, and therefore students are going through that activity and they might have questions that they need answering afterwards. So the queries that are brought back to the face-to-face -face environment. So you've got a link there, you've got the starting off with the face-to-face -face environment, maybe really resources associated to that face-to-face -face contact. You then send the students off, they do some work, and then we need to try and tie that back in, some way that the students can then ask queries, follow up on things they didn't know. So that process there is to try and give students a solid understanding of the course content. And it's quite a simple process. I'm not trying to make this more complex than it is. Um, but it's an ability of using um, an activity to enable students to judge their own understandings. And that might also be not just whether they've remembered the content, in fact, that's quite a low level learning outcome, whether they've remembered something, but how they apply that content to a particular problem and how they can come up with their own approaches, how they start to evaluate the way things, things are happening, how they can evaluate different resources and apply those to different contexts as well. So what we'll be looking at here is how engagement with lecture content, engagement with seminar materials before during and after that face-to-face -face time can be prepared with um, different learning activities. And of course, we're talking here about learning technology, so those learning activities will be taking place online. So the first case study to talk about today is um, how we can encourage students to have um, uh, interleaved practice. So this element of the learning and teaching strategy where students are required to retrieve previously learned content and apply that to new contexts. But before they can start applying stuff, they need to have a good grip on what the fundamentals are. And one way of doing that is to provide an online quiz. So this case study comes from language and linguistics, and parts of the fundamental concepts include these uh, phonetic symbols. And it's just one example, but you can think about how some fundamental knowledge might be key to your particular discipline. So students are allowed to progress through these quizzes in their own time, and they are also used in a different form. There's two types of quizzes that the lecturer created, one for students to use in their self-paced um, own study time, and another which was used as a formative assessment. And that allowed the lecturer to gauge how well the students understood some fundamental concepts. Now, that can just be whether they've learnt the, the raw content, but more interestingly is how they apply that to a particular problem or case study. So, for example, if you um, have a, a more um, hypothetical situation and you wanted students to try and apply their knowledge to that situation, you can create a quiz that allow, enables them to, to test their own um, application of that knowledge, and then you as a lecturer monitoring the results of that quiz to then um, bring that into face-to-face -face session. Maybe you can adapt the way you're lecturing, provide some additional resources based upon that. So as part of the quiz tool, students can actually get feedback on their results automatically. So the quiz tool enables you to give uh, feedback if a student gets an answer correct or feedback if a student answers incorrectly. And that feedback doesn't have to just be the uh, correct answer. And in fact, that's not very valuable. What's more valuable is to direct the students to the resources so that they can reinterpret them and, and try and understand themselves why they got that answer wrong. As an instructor then, you can monitor student performance um, using the grade centre within the VLE. As students complete the tests, the scores appear in the grade centre, so you get a sense of how well the cohort is performing. You can also drill down to individual students. So the way I've used this before, uh, as just an example design, which helped the um, students to look at some course content first of all before the face-to-face -face session, they then undertook a quiz on that content before the session, and then I used the lecture to address some of the common concerns from the quiz. In this case here, this was about accessibility, it's about making um, digital resources accessible to disabled students. So I had a mini lecture online, a quiz the students undertook, and then in the lecture, I went through their common concerns 
So it's just a way to make more use of that face-to-face -face time and also give students the opportunity to check their own understanding using a structured learning activity. So to set this up, it's very easy to do. Um, within any content area on the VLE, you go to the assessments um, button at the top of the, the content area and then choose test. And you'd set that up um, uh, as, a, as a test area and then you link to that test area. So there's a two-step process in there, but we have a guide that's for that and I'll send all the guides, all the technical guidance for the case studies out after the, at the, end, the end of the session. So the second case study that I want to show you, again, looking at the idea of space and interleave practice, the idea that students perhaps need to re-engage with content in multiple times, um, draws upon a case study from economics, where the lecturer identified that students were coming into the economics program without the fundamental mathematical knowledge that they needed to actually succeed in the program. So students were coming in from a whole range of different abilities, and you might have that, this within your own discipline as well, students not having all the background knowledge they need to engage with uh, the module content. Now this example is mathematical space, but you could apply it to um, languages or other types of um, uh, subjects as well. And here the lecturer used video in two ways. The first way was to record the common problems that always come up every year. So in this case it was how you would do averages um, and how you would look at creating averages of a population and the process for that was recorded using a piece of paper and a webcam and the lecturer narrating as they went through step by step so students got hold of that before the lecture so they could come to the lecture if they'd not looked at averages before come to the lecture knowing what all the symbols meant so that in the lecture time wasn't spent going over the basics where some students would already know it and some students wouldn't after the lecture the lecturer then recorded another set of videos based upon the common queries that came from email and during the lecture itself. Now these might not have been pre-identified, these might be things specific to that cohort. So the lecturer chose to use video to supplement the lecture in that way, rather than going over a lot of detail in the lecture time, to, to go over the nuanced detail using a video instead. So this is then allowing students to get that core understanding, but they can revisit these learning resources during their other learning activities when they're doing assessment. So you can create this using um, the replay at desk software, and you can do this at any time at, at your own computer if you're on campus, or you can download the software and use it on your own um, device as well. But you would structure this ideally within some form of learning activity as well. So although we have the videos in the case study are examples of where the uh, lecture is the focus of attention, you would also um, have the opportunity to structure these videos within a learning activity. So asking students to watch a video, perhaps submit some work based on that video, perhaps come prepared to a seminar, uh, questions based on the video, or even undertaking a quiz. So that's the first section. Um, are there any questions so far on what I've covered there in terms of the quizzes and the use of video and how that might help students get to grips with some fundamental college, um, content before um, each uh, session? It's very much like blended learning and, and indeed the flipped classroom is just a, a buzzword for what is been going on for, for decades in terms of blended learning, thinking about the way that the online space can be used to provide resources and structured learning and how that blends with the expectations of learning in the face-to-face -face environment. Absolutely. Flip classroom indeed. So uh, the next um, element I wanted to talk about is student engagement and um, how we can support engagement in and out of class. So Here's a very broad question for you. Um, what forms of student interaction, the student interaction either with you or with other students, what forms of student interaction actually support learning? So that might not be uh, an answer that is the same for every discipline, but from your own experience, what do you think actually contributes towards student learning in terms of their interactions with other people?
Thanks very much for your comments in the text chat box. There seems to be a common thread here, and this is all about um, discussion and getting students to um, discuss with their peers and um, indeed with you as a lecturer. And why is that discussion actually important? Why do we need students to, to, to discuss things? What's the value of actually doing that discussion? So Ellie says there is about challenging their own understanding and their preconceptions and experiences. Carmen says to reflect on their learning, discussing on their difficulties as they go along. And Ellie says there again, um, sort of getting to think about why they feel a certain way. And that's a brilliant um, uh, summary of why discussion is vital uh, in, in education, to, to get people to um, challenge their own preconceptions and one way we can do this um, and this might be a way of structuring the discussion it might not be appropriate for all contexts but um, how do you get students to start, start to surface their own um, reflections on their own understanding well we want them to be very much engaged in the face-to-face -face session we don't want them to be sitting back passively at all so this particular um, case study tries to address the learning teaching strategy about contact time to inspire and engage students. And inspiration absolutely does not have to just come from the lecturer. Inspiration could come from other students and working with each other. So how might we design an activity in the face-to-face -face environment, particularly if you've got large cohorts or when you're looking at a topic that could be quite um, challenging to, to, to start a discussion with. Well, the case study we have from here is from biology, but there's an equal case study that came from the Department of Education um, who were doing this, a very similar approach with po a small postgraduate group as well. So we have case studies of both a postgraduate small group teaching, and in this case, biology's large group undergraduate teaching. And they used um, the uh, an in-class polling tool. This is a quiz. It allows you to send questions out to the students and get them to send their responses back to you via a mobile app. Now, you can do this either as multiple choice quizzes, but you can also ask for text responses. You can use it as a way for students to post you messages during the lecture that then you can pick up later on um, at the end of the lecture or at various points to address those questions in the same way that we use in the text chat today. Um, you can also do numerical calculations and things, things like that with it. But this polling tool um, is again, a way to scaffold some sort of interaction. Now, the way it's been used um, in various uh, disciplines is not just to test students' knowledge. Again, testing students' knowledge is a very fundamental, basic um, level of understanding. It doesn't really show how they're developing their learning through what are higher order learning outcomes. So we want students to be able to apply their knowledge and we can use the quiz to do this. We might want to start off the quiz with some simple quiz um, type questions, checking their knowledge, but we can progress into applying that knowledge to a problem. And when you're doing that, when you're asking students to respond to a question that asks them to apply their knowledge, you can then get students to justify their answer to their peers. So if they have a particular take on how a problem might be addressed, justify that with your peers. And then it's also interesting to repeat the question using the poll. And you might see a shift in the responses to reflect the way that students have changed their thinking. Now, that's the way that biology used it. They actually had some scientific problems and they asked students to respond before and, and after a discussion. But you could use this um, for more um, of sort of ethical debates, um, debates that are less about applying um, scientific principles, but more about your uh, personal uh, take on something. Now, I did this with um, some copyright training with um, some undergraduate students. And, I, and instead of teaching them, you know, here's the copyright law, I, I got them to think about how um, copyright affected the individual. And I showed them various scenarios and say, okay, imagine you were in this scenario, 
what would your reaction be to someone using your copyrighted work? And immediately the group started to divide. We ended up with polarization of opinion and that was a great stimulus for some in-depth discussion and it showed that different people have different views about, in that case, copyright, but it could be any other type of philosophical discussion. So the polling tool there is a great way for students to um, surface their own, um, let's say, prejudices or, or reflections on, on where they are at um, in an anonymous way, and then you can use it as a holistic group um, output for uh, further discussion. Now, if you don't have the opportunity to get students all together in, in a classroom, perhaps you've got students who are um, distributed in some way. That might be if you've got students remote learning or students who are on placement or um, even students who would normally want a face-to-face -face program but you wanted to add some extra contact time outside, then you can use, of course, this tool. You can use the Collaborate webinar platform for those sorts of interactions as well. So again, this is an opportunity to get students to, do, to use that um, immediate synchronous discussion, although they might not be all together in the same space. So one of the examples is to use this in a lab. So if you've got students distributed throughout a lab, you can get them all on Collaborate on the PC lab, uh, and PCs in the lab, you can do a mini lecture or you can use that space so that students can talk to each other throughout the lab session. Um, if you've got students on placement, um, then you can get them all together at various points during the placement so they can learn from each other's own placement experiences. But you're there as a mediator in that, that sense. You're there as a lecturer to facilitate that discussion, not necessarily leading it. So you can also use this platform to bring in external speakers. Now that Carmen used I think yeah, Carmen used this platform uh, for a conference actually where a speaker wasn't able to come into the session and so they could use uh, this platform to bring them in. So if you've got, um, if, you, if you're in a subject, perhaps the social sciences where uh, you want some expertise from outside the institution to come in, maybe to demonstrate how different um, uh, theories are actually put into practice and you can't get them into the classroom then you could set up uh, either a webinar and invite the guest speaker in that way or you can use this tool within a classroom environment. So um, I've just sort of put a design on there but I think those those examples probably make more sense. Commons use it great and I hope it works all right. So uh, that's touching upon there how the, the synchronous interna interactions, that idea of discussion could work both in and out of the class. But there's another form of interaction which is a sort of that discussion as well that can happen outside of class asynchronously. Now I've couched this area as enabling feedback. Um, so enabling students to learn from feedback. And that feedback might actually come from staff, it might come from students. But what I'd like to ask you now is then, what do you expect students to actually do with any feedback that you provide to them on their student work as they go through the module, on their formative work, on their summative work? What do you actually expect students to do with the feedback that you provide? So Carmen's mentioned there sort of bringing queries from the feedback, um, which is quite useful because that's about closing the feedback loop. That's making sure that when you give feedback to students, students then have the opportunity to say, great, okay, I think I've done this this way or I think I've interpreted this way and now I can check with you to make sure I can then, um, I've interpreted the feedback correctly. And then also in terms of supporting their learning, so using the feedback and then feeding that forward into their next assignment, the next next piece of work. Um, as Ali said there about how to bear that feedback in mind when redrafting work. So it requires some sort of engagement with the feedback. So it's no good just sort of posting feedback out and hoping something sticks. Now the case that I've got here, um, this is actually about the way that, that peer feedback can work and how it's been designed in and actually aligned with program learning outcomes. So here we're looking at that idea of progressive development towards program learning outcomes, which does require some sort of feedback um, because how can you 
progress if you don't know where you're progressing from. So in this case study, we have um, education. Uh, so this is not a peer feedback example. This is another type of feedback example. But this case study comes from education where the students are submitting a piece of written work. And this is using the standard assignment um, submission tool. So this is not the anonymous assignment submission tool. This is the formative assignment submission tool where students can submit pieces of work using a Word document or a PDF through the VLE. Now, the marker can then mark directly within the VLE on that work and then the student can collect that work through the VLE and see annotations. So here the forms of annotations could be little post-it notes, they can be squiggles, they can be highlights, they can be summary comments and you can also use rubrics so marking matrix type feedback as well. So that feedback goes back to the student but then what happens to it? Um, so you might need to design not just uh, thinking about the way that feedback um, goes back to students either digitally or, or, or in paper, but how can you then get the students to utilize that feedback for their subsequent work? This is where we talk about those links between the face-to-face -face and the online and the face-to-face -face again. If you're setting up the assignment task, it's taking place online, how do you then get the students to engage with that task? There needs to be some sort of motivation. How might you motivate the students? Well, if you've got that feedback and the opportunity to discuss it. Now, the discussion of feedback um, also requires some sort of personal um, aspect to it. Now, this is where the education case study is quite interesting. Instead of just providing the written feedback, the lecturer recorded themselves as they were writing the feedback to the student. So they weren't trying to give detailed feedback across every tiny little mistake or area of improvement on the work. They were focusing, focusing in on two or three key areas that the student could really improve on and explaining that through the medium of video. And the medium of video allows you to be quite critical um, but also personable. Now, these students were um, coming in and um, perhaps they weren't used to the way of academic writing in the department. So the lecturer could, for example, move things around the, uh, the page. They could say, take this bit here, put it actually in this part of the document because that makes the document flow a bit better. And that's far better explained verbally than it is by trying to draw a squiggly line and move it here because then you can rationalize that and justify that to student to give them a sense of how you think as an academic writer and they can learn from that process. So the video then is used as a way of, of capturing that. But that's not to say that video is the only way to do this. There might be some aspects that are too serious, shall we say, for video. That might be plagiarism where you actually need to make sure that the students really got a grip on um, why something might be plagiarism, considered plagiarism or not. In that case you'd arrange a face-to-face -face meeting. But you could still structure a way for students to reflect on their feedback using the online space. And you could use that using a student journal. So a journal is like a private blog space. And you can embed these blog spaces within the VLE, getting the student to put in their feedback into that blog space, and then writing how they're going to adapt their future approach based upon that feedback. So that blog space is, is almost like a, a log of how they're developing their learning and that might be within the module that could even be at a program level and that would allow for some alignment between the different years and drawing upon summative work as well. So the standard assignment tool if you did want to collect work in in a PDF or a Word document format and annotate that online and provide that straight back to the students that's within assessments and assignment and um, watch out for though that this is non-anonymous, so exam numbers can never be used in this formative assignment tool. So we've talked briefly about um, students sort of reflecting on their um, their own interpretation of uh, and their own understanding in the idea of uh, discussion. Uh, we've talked briefly there about the use of feedback. Well, what happens if you try and combine the two? So here we're looking at um, developing insight through structured and interactive discussion, which is part of the learning teaching strategy, with a particular context here on how practice and theory um, relate to each other. So Again, another case study from education where the students had structured weekly reflection on their learning. So they had to undertake uh, particular activities. So they would um, have three questions that they had to answer each week. And they post that to a 
blog space with drawing upon some research, drawing upon some data and interpreting that and analyzing that and putting that into a blog post. So a short 300 word summary, for example, which covers those questions for that week. Now that's a, a blog space within the course. So everyone in the course could see, with everyone within the module could see what everyone else has posted. And part of the activity was then to respond to another student's summary and ask them questions back. So facilitating that peer learning through um, almost, uh, it goes a little bit beyond just simply discussion. It go, it's actually a structured activity, activity that requires the student to challenge and prompt their peers to think about the issues they've discussed in their blog post. And this was all about how practice and theory um, related. On top of that then, um, as well as you've got the, the, the peer feedback, the, which is the bulk of that activity, uh, and this related to the seminar discussions as well, so they could carry on the discussions from the seminar or they could bring the discussions into the seminar. Wrapped around all of that is the tutor who has an oversight of that activity. So even though you have groups of students working together, the tutor can then have a holistic view and bring some of the common threads together into the face-to-face -face seminar discussion. So the role of the tutor is still important there as well. Any type of activity like that where you have, you're setting expectations for students, you really need to align those, um, what you're requiring the students to do, what they're intending to learn, to the learning outcomes of the module, to what they're going to do in the face-to-face -face session, showing how that activity throughout the whole module will actually support their summative assessment. By you then coming in as well as a tutor, looking at that work um, and then perhaps private, providing a little bit of summary feedback on the whole group, again, that allows students to judge the, where they're up to in terms of meeting those learning outcomes. So the blog tool, if you wanted to play around with this, um, you would create a blog space first and then you create a link to it. It's a two-step process, just like um, other, other parts of the tool, other like the quiz tool. Um, again, we've got the guide for that. And you can configure this in three different ways. We've talked about the private journal, that one-to-one -one discussion between the student and the lecturer. Um, we've got the whole course um, space, so everyone can post to the space and everyone can view the space. But you can also have um, almost like a... A slightly more public journal where you have each individual student has their own space but still everyone can see them all so three different options there and I'll circulate the guides afterwards so you can see uh, what the options are so the final um, aspects uh, to talk about here again uh, this, this is all within the area of feedback but this is a little bit more creative this was an assessment um, that was designed to facilitate collaboration group working skills and development of transferable skills particularly about communicating um, the subject and in archaeology they had a video project where students had to create videos they actually had to create posters and pamphlets for a museum they worked in partnership with an external agency creating multimedia objects for a museum to use to explain I think this was at Briary Banks it's a it's a, a, a place in in Yorkshire where they um, they were doing some uh, uh, generating the, the materials for what was key here though was not just the students developing these multimedia skills um, but also how they reflected on that group working process and the assessment wasn't just about the output the assessment was about a, a reflective report that um, showed how the students took their understanding of the subject condensed that down into something that the general public would want to use but the feedback element here wasn't just from um, the lecturer, it wasn't just from peers, it's actually from those who are in practice. Because they're in partnership with the museums and they're creating resources for the museums, you then have feedback from the museum staff, you also have the feedback from the general public, and then the students could draw upon that again to develop their understanding and incorporate that within their reflective report. So it's a really nice partnership arrangement there, again relating perhaps the theoretical aspects with the practical aspects within a project to, uh, I put this in inverted quotes, um, the real world outside the, the module context. So technology is involved here just because it's, it's, it's a more creative way to demonstrate um, uh, the, the student's understanding rather than just writing an essay. So in summary then, uh, all I've shown you here are just a small selection of the different tools and approaches that learning design that involves technology can actually support students' learning. And 
I've divided this up into staff student contact and student work and roughly aligned the different tools that we've got to those two areas of the pedagogy. So this idea of staff student contact, we touched upon the webinar tool that you're using at the moment, the in-class polling, use of the at-desk recordings, on the student work side, um, looking at the ways we can do peer assessment and, and formative assessment through Yorkshire, the online quizzes, and other things such as the video tools, maybe creating Google Sites, maybe creating public blog spaces. Bridging both of those areas though as, as a way of structuring student work and also facilitating staff student contact are the blog tools, the wiki tools, the discussion boards that exist on, on Yorkshire. Certainly the blog tool is the, is the simplest to use, it's the straightforward, most straightforward to use and if you've got a very targeted learning activity that works best. But you can also use something called discussion boards, which allows for more complex um, structures of discussion. For example, a question and answer for um, module assignments, which is what some departments use regularly. Uh, actually, mathematics and, and psychology use those, where there's, there's a discussion board in every uh, module where the students um, can post uh, questions and, and the lecturer responds. The advantage there is that the lecturer is not dealing with loads of emails and if a question is posed the answer is then seen by everyone in that cohort as well. So there are different tools for different types of approach. Now the handbook, the Yorktel handbook, the York Technology Enhanced Learning Handbook um, details all these approaches and let me just put that um, into the text chat box so you can click that link quite easily. Section 4 will help you decide what tool is, is appropriate for the type of learning that you want to achieve. So we always start with what do you want to achieve in terms of learning experience and then we can help you find the right tool for that. So, uh, chapter 5 looks at actually how that works in practice, how you'd facilitate the activity during the activity itself. So the handbook is there to support um, all of these ideas. Okay, and that's the end of the webinar. I've gone through a, a number of case studies there and I, I've gone through them quite quickly, I admit, but I will provide um, the links to the detailed case studies and the technical guides afterwards. Would you like to ask any questions or some comments on what you've seen? Maybe some things are appropriate for you, maybe some things aren't appropriate for you, and that's absolutely fine. Obviously, we're not here to try, try and push all the software. We're trying to make sure that you're choosing the right um, uh, tools for the right uh, learning approach. So I'd be interested to see if anything's resonated with you, uh, if you just want to pop that in the text chat, um, or if you have any questions. And I will stop recording now as well, um, so you could be